another of my goals, Eric, is I'm trying to create a sense of mass and density. And this was something I learned from the wonderful conductor and violinist Scott Yu. Um, he was always saying, DK, you gotta somehow come across as bigger than you are. And I love that when after a concert, if somebody comes back to my dressing room to say hello or to congratulate me, they look at me and they're like, wow, you are actually much shorter and smaller than you look on stage. That's good because I wanna look massive. So I try to create lots of right angles with my legs, with my ankles, with my, just, I try to just feel weight and mass and density and resistance and all these words, cholesterol, high cholesterol sound, all this slow, pull a slow bow, all these things to try to create the great Philadelphia Orchestra sound. If I'm light and I'm, I tuck my feet under, I feel like the sound from my section is different. If I tuck my feet under my chair and I'm kind of on the front edge of my chair and I'm kind of playing chamber music with just principal oboe or, you know, I'm just kind of like I'm in my own world, I don't feel that the sound comes from my section the same. But if I put my rear end back and I try to feel a weight, and I try to feel, and my bow is kind of sticky on the strings, never kind of lots of bow. I, I tend to use a little bit less bow, but sticky. I can just feel the, the mass density behind me. And uh, that's what Philadelphia Orchestra sound is all about. Heavy vibrato, thickness, lots of cholesterol. Oh, I love that. <laughs> so along this diet of really heavy playing, uh, when you're doing the opposite, how do you try to communicate that lightness as well? Well, this I learned from Glenn Dictoreau. Uh, I stole it from Glenn Dictoreau. When he really wanted his section to quiet down, and it doesn't always work, but he, he would play at the tip, lift the fiddle, look up at the ceiling behind him and flutter his eyelids like. <laughs> and so I try to do that sometimes and sometimes it actually works. And, and sometimes as a last resort, I might just stand up and say to my section, I think we're overpowering whatever. Mm -hmm. the violas at letter B. Let's just be a little bit careful or something. I'll try to say it. And as I'm saying it, as I stand up, I try to be very surgical and quick. Like I'll try to do it when the conductor is speaking to the other side of the stage, not when he's speaking to maybe the front, front row of the winds or the seconds. No, when he's, he or she is looking over here and speaking and working with them, I quickly stand up and I blur my eyes. I learned this from a friend in the Berlin Philharmonic. I don't look at anyone in particular looking for a, a reaction or a nod or anything. I blur my eyes and look at the back wall so nobody feels like I'm singling them out and like, uh, could we not rush at, at letter B, Joe? No, 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 I'm not doing that. I'm blurring my eyes and very quick, very surgical, letter B, everybody. You know, just very kind of, it's us, you know, let's collaboratively just a little, you know, something like that. There's so many different aspects that go into this. Um, I, I'm always thinking about when you're playing and it's, it's really like chamber music in an orchestra, but how do you sh showcase and share your individuality within that setting? and yet at the same time really blend the sound? Like what, what's the secret to blending the sound but having your individuality at the same time? Well, I think that uh, if you're in the section, you have to blend. And your individuality, you just have to trust is going out. But um, as a section leader, you, there are always solos. This season in particular, 2021-22, um, has been crazy. Post-pandemic season, we did a week of Scheherazade, a week of Beethoven Misa Solemnis, Ein Heldenleben, um, just incredibly huge and important solos. And so um, those are obviously opportunities that I can display a lot of individual, individuality. But I just happen to be um, the kind of person that loves when a conductor tells me what he or she wants. Yeah. And I always go to them before the first rehearsal and say, 
maestro or maestra, what, what, what are you thinking for this gigantic Ein Heldenleben solo? What, what, what do you like? And many times they are very descriptive, very specific, and they tell me exactly what they want, and then I try to give them as much of that as I possibly can. So then that begs the question, when you're switching from one role to the other, how do you make that switch, both in terms of psychologically, but also in terms of the sound? Well, uh, you know, that kind of um, quick adjustments of sound density and volume, those are things that, you know, you, you can't become a member of a great orchestra without those skills. So it's all about listening. It's all about listening. And once in a while, I'm just as guilty as everybody else, and I forget to listen, and all of a sudden I realize I'm sticking out, or I'm behind, or I'm ahead, or I'm a little sharp, or, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong if you stop listening. So listening, and then trusting your muscle memory to make adjustments, whether it's point of contact, whether it's bow pressure, whether it's bow speed, using your vision to look around to see where others are. If the violas have a passage before and then you guys join, you look over and see which part of the bow they're in and you just join right in. So it's uh, very much uh, a case of awareness.